comes up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. On and on and on and on it goes And it overwhelms and satisfies my soul And I never ever have to be afraid Cause one thing remains Your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My death is paid there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. And Lord, I need. comes my way and when I cannot stand up all on you Jesus you're my hope and stay so Lord I need you oh I need you every hour I need Just 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. God, we need you. God, I need you tonight, Lord, to speak through me. God, I pray that it's your words that, that come out and not mine. God, because I need you to speak your truth, God. And I just pray that, that uh, hearts will be changed tonight, God. And, and I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Uh, thank you, everyone who's here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm excited about this message. Uh, I'm nervous. I'm a little nervous, I'm not going to lie. But I'm excited more than anything. Um, Valerie asked me to, uh, to speak tonight. We're, we're hoping to, to make this a more common thing to, to maybe appeal to a, a larger crowd of, of younger, um, younger uh, people, like the young adult crowd, the youth crowd. Um, and, uh, and I wasn't sure what I was going to preach on. I was like, man, you know, what am I going to do? 
And at first I thought it was just the youth. And I was like, oh, okay, well, all right. And I started thinking. And then she told me, no, it's the whole congregation. It's going to be a Sunday night service. And I was like, well, dang, I've already agreed to it now. I can't, I can't. Uh, but, uh, but no, then I had to, I definitely had to, to change my thought process on what, um, what I was going to speak on. And, uh, but then it hit me. Um, this is something that uh, has been on my mind for, for quite some time. I'd say close to, to six months. God put it on my heart and on my mind. And, uh, and through time spent with Him and through time in, in Scripture and prayer, uh, it's just amplified more and more. And, it's, and I feel like it's something that needs to be addressed. And, uh, and I hope that I am able to just uh, address it and, and, and explain it to y'all uh, clearly. I just hope that it comes out as it is in my head. It, it sounds good in my head, I promise. So if it doesn't come out good... It, at least it sounds good to me. But um, my sermon tonight is on um, self-justification. And uh, that's a big word, right? Yeah, I know. Um, but uh, we as humans have a lifetime of experience at um, justifying our own actions, our own sins. And what I mean by that is um, we've spent our lifetime perfecting the ability to use excuses and reasons as a way of convincing ourselves and convincing others that our actions, our sins are somehow permitted, are excused, um, maybe they're, they're not that bad, uh, or they don't need to be dealt with. And this is, you know, this is uh, it's a dangerous way of thinking. And I, and I hope that, uh, that, you, that you understand what I'm saying. And, and it may be that as I'm saying this right now, you're thinking of that one sin that you may have, maybe more I've had, you know, Plenty of sins where I've tried to say, you know what, no, I'm not, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a sin, but I'm dealing with it, it's fine, you know, I don't need to make a big deal out of it, and I just, um, that's not the way we need to think about these things, it's, it's a serious issue, because whether we believe it or not, we're still sinning, and uh, just to kind of give a perspective on this, I want to talk about um, Robinson Crusoe, I don't know if you've ever heard of Robinson Crusoe, but it's, uh, well, first, let me give you why, how this came up. I've never read Robinson Crusoe. I, wouldn't, I don't have the time or the, the um, desire to read that much, I'll be honest, unless it's the Bible. But uh, when Valerie told me about this and, and asked me to do it, um, I was at a softball tournament. I rode up there with Tom Robinson and his, uh, and his son Grant and then Tim, me and Tim, us four. We rode up there together. It was a great time. But anyways... Um, uh, that night before we left was when Valerie asked me to and when I realized what I was going to preach on. And then on the way home, um, it was a certain person's turn to drive. And uh, they wanted to listen to a book on tape. And I'm not going to say who it was out of us four, but he has black curly hair and we have the same mom and dad. So you just, you know. <laughs> um, but he wanted to listen to a book on tape and, or CD, I guess, technically CD, book on CD. And I was like, God, you're kidding me. That's the last thing I would want to listen to on a, like, eight-hour drive home. But we listened to Robinson Crusoe, and it's a book. It's actually, it's very interesting. I enjoyed it very much. Um, it's very dry. If I had to read it, I would probably fall asleep. But listening to it wasn't too bad. Um, it's about this guy who, he lives, uh, he's got a good life, a middle-class life. Um, I guess he's in England or something like that. But... Uh, he wants, to, he wants to go on voyages. He wants to go like on a ship and just have all kinds of adventures. And it's against his parents' uh, pleading, that's what he does. And the very, first, um, the very first boat he gets on, like right out the gate or out the harbor or whatever, like he starts having problems. Like the first night there's a storm and he thinks he's going to die. And he's just telling God, like, God, I'm so sorry, just deliver me from this, and, you know, I'll never do this again. I'm such an idiot, I'm going to go straight to my parents and apologize and, and live the easy middle-class life, you know, as long as you just deliver me from this. And then, and then the storm uh, lets up, and his friend that he went on the trip with, um, whose dad owns the boat, comes and comforts him and is like, that's nothing, that was nothing, that wasn't a storm, you know. You just wait, you'll probably see something way worse, and they did. They got later on, um, there was a storm, the same trip, the same trip, there was a storm, so bad that it sunk their ship and somebody had to, and they were close to, to land, so someone came out and rescued him, and so they're sitting there watching the ship go under, and he's just thinking, man. And by this time, he had already ki- just changed his mind about the whole, like, you know, promising God. He was like, ah, you know, whatever. I made it through that. So he had already changed his mind. And so then he gets on land, and the friend that he went with, whose dad owns the boat, like, 
pretty much gives him the same ser- sermon his dad did of how, like, this life is not for you. You should take this as a sign that the, like, the ship life is just not for you. Like, go back home. And um, I want to read a quote that, uh, from this book regarding that. Um, and it's kind of wordy. It's kind of confusing, but it, it makes sense. So, uh, but my ill fate rushed me on now with an obstin- obstin- obstinacy. God, that's a weird word. Obstinacy that nothing could resist. And though I had several times loud calls from my reason and my more composed judgment to go home, yet I had no power to do it. I know not what to call this, nor will I urge that as a secret overruling decree that hurries us on to be the instruments of our own destruction. So he knew, he knew that he should just go home, like call it quits, learn his lesson, but he just couldn't do it. And he became the instrument of, instrument of his own destruction. And I feel like um, self-justification is just that for us. Because, um, like I said earlier, we ignore the fact that we have sin. We disregard it. And so we disregard our need for redemption from that sin. And that is, like I said, that is, um, that's uh, bringing about our own destruction because we need redemption. We need uh, forgiveness from Jesus for our own sins. And, uh, and I'm sure you can think of a time where... Um, you felt the spirit of truth calling on you, telling you, like, don't do this. You know this is wrong. You know what you should do. It's trying to lead you in the ways of, of Christ and the steps of Christ, but you ignore it. You won't let it, you won't let it take hold of you and, and lead you the right way. And your self-justification just keeps pulling you back to your sin for some reason. And, and some of these reasons, I'm gonna, I listed a few reasons as to why this might would happen. It could be your pride. You could be thinking, like, uh, at least I'm not doing this, or at least I'm not this person, at least I don't do that. Um, and for that, I have a uh, passage of Scripture to, uh, to go to, to look at that. And the passage of Scripture is, um, oh crap, where's it at? Luke 18 something. Let me find it. Luke 18, 9 through 10. That's where it's at. I had it I had it in here. Somebody took, somebody sabotaged this. I'm going to find out here. Um, Luke 18, 9 through 10. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even the like of this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. And for now, we're going to read the last part of that scripture later about the tax collector's prayer. But for now, I want to focus a little bit on this Pharisee. I mean, what a jerk, right? <laughs> I thank you I'm not like everybody else. You know, look at me. And I just want to, um, my, my friend Steve, he's here with us tonight from school. He, I told him about this message, and he, he showed me this book that, that uh, it's a Middle Eastern theologian who's just a smart dude, you know, way smarter than I am. And he, he breaks down a lot of the parables of Jesus. And, and so I got a lot of this from him, most of this here from him. Um, one, one fact I want to point out is that the Pharisee's prayer, and Jesus would have known this, um, the Pharisee's prayer, according to the first century Judaism, is not a prayer at all. It doesn't fall under any of the three categories of prayer, which is confession of sin, thanks for bounty, Petition for oneself and for others. And so, yeah, he's giving thanks, but he's giving thanks that he's not some other person. And it's just, you know, but you have to be careful when looking at this passage because you could almost catch yourself saying, God, I'm glad I'm not that Pharisee. I'm not like that Pharisee. And in, in a way, you become just like the Pharisee. But I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's our problem. That's not really what, um, what we, we do when we read this passage. But we have to catch ourselves sometimes and, and thinking, you know, well, it's not that bad. You know, I'm not doing it like this. And when you say that, you have to be referencing, referencing it from somewhere, from someone else who may struggle with the same sin, who uh, it's on a different level. Or maybe people just know about it. And so it seems like it has more of an effect. And so that's the, with the Pharisee, you have to be careful on the way that we, um, we think about our sin, the way we justify our sin. And I'm going to save that. I'm going to put my note card back in its rightful place. And so 
that stems from pride. And it may be that your pride stems from your age. You, you, uh, you know, you hear older, wiser, yeah. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hacking on old people here. I'm not, I don't mean it by that because, yeah, when you're older, you're wiser, you know more. But, uh, but just if you think you're content with the ways of Jesus, with your walk with Jesus, you think that you figured this whole religion thing out and you're just content with what you're doing now. You know, you pray, you may go to church but you're not trying to learn more about Jesus. That's like going into a marriage. Yeah, you're going to know a lot about the person you get married, hopefully, but you're going to learn things. You're going to learn more and more stuff as you go along in that marriage. So when we pledge ourselves to Jesus, when we marry Jesus, um, we want to learn more about him. We need to learn more about him in our walk. We can't just stay stagnant. And to do that is is ignorant, to be honest. Uh, That sounded really bad, but it is. Another reason we might uh, justify the things that we do because of circumstances. Um, God, you don't know what I've been through. You have no idea, right? I mean, yeah, like I'm sure we've all been guilty of that. I have thinking, you know, I, whatever it is you're going through, no one else on the planet has ever gone through it ever in their life, which is dumb. But uh, a lot of times they can make you feel better about yourself saying that it's just such a hard time that, that, yeah, it's okay that you're, you're doing these things. You have resentment towards these certain people because, um, like, you know, you don't know what they did to me. Like, I have every right to be angry at them, to hold bitterness towards them when you don't because that is sin. And you're convincing yourself that it's okay when it's, when it's not. Or maybe it's uh, driving down the road, and I'm just going to say guilty right here, driving down the road and the light turns green and you're at a stoplight and it takes somebody five seconds to just let off the brake and you're thinking how dare they make me late for like you know whatever it is you're going to and so you're 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 getting angry and you're you're probably yelling at somebody and uh again though that's another justification of you of yourself like well <laughs> they don't know how to drive so it's okay i can yell at them all want. plus they can't hear me plus nobody can hear me so it's okay i didn't you know it's, it's not a big deal it may be denial. Um, you may be thinking, I'm young. I can start living right. I can deal with this sin later on in life. I've got plenty of time. Uh, and that's a slippery slope there because, you know, we've, we're told we're not promised tomorrow and we have to live for today. And just because you're young doesn't mean you can't get yourself right and you can't do amazing things for Christ. And uh, we may be thinking, if I admit this sin, if I admit that, that it's, I'm struggling with it, then what's going to be the certain? What's going to be the um, the outcome? What am I going to have to do? What am I going to have to change about my life? And we're afraid of that, and so we don't want to. We don't want to admit it. We don't want to fess up and and tell ourselves and tell God, even though He already knows and we already know that that this sin has has taken a hold of us. Maybe it's because you're so ashamed of it. I've been there. There's, I've had sins where I've been so ashamed that I didn't want to tell anybody, and uh, and for to that I say. Find someone that you know you can trust. I mean, obviously, talk to God about it, but always find someone you can trust. Uh, maybe you think it's just one sin. It's not that big a deal. Nobody knows about it. That can be, we can disguise that as if nobody knows about it, then it's not that big a deal because it's not affecting my life, right? It's not affecting my physical life, so it's not that big a deal. But it's tearing down your spiritual life because, I mean, this life doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is your relationship with Christ and when and it's like lying to somebody who already knows the truth it's like how you hear like women they'll ask questions already know what the answer is and so you better not lie to them I mean it's kind of like that because God's not going to try and set you up to you know to for failure but you're lying to God you're lying to yourself when you both know the truth um another quote from uh Robinson Crusoe uh is um he's talking here he's talking about um just people in general uh, they are not ashamed to sin, and yet they are ashamed to repent. A lot of times, we're not that ashamed of our sin because it's hidden. And so, and we know if we repent, then more than likely it'll, it'll come out, and that's when the shame comes. We're, and that's, that's bad because you should be ashamed of your sin knowing that it is shameful. But that shouldn't stop you from repenting and, and asking God for forgiveness. Let's see, where am I at? So what, uh, 
What stems from this self-justification, from this lying to ourselves and to God and to others? Um, we can look at everyone else, disregard the circumstances that they may be going through, verbally or personally to yourself, condemn them for it, and find hatred in others for it. It's almost like you're looking for someone, you're eager to find fault in someone that's greater than yours as a, a further means of making yourself feel better and justifying your own sins. And even sometimes, I know, and I say this, I say we, because I hope I'm not the only one, because I have done this. I've looked at people who, who I know, you know, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who I know struggle with the same things as me and get mad at them for it. And, and why, do, why do we do this? We do it because the truth is that we hate this sin because it plagues our life and it's so much easier to condemn others than it is ourselves. When really all we want is uh, freedom from the chains of these sins. And uh, like I said, I hope I'm not the only one because if I am, that'd be a little awkward. But I, I have faith and, and, and I believe that we've all gone through this. So you may, think, uh, you may think that you have the ability to justify your own sins. You may be caught in the lie by yourself, by Satan, that, that if you don't, if you don't uh, address your sins to yourself or to others, that they, they're non-existent, that they don't have an effect on your life. But I'm here to tell you that you need to address these sins. You need to get them right because they affect your heart. And whether you know it or not, they affect your, your, outer, your um, outward life because they affect the way you think, the way you perceive others, the way you look at others, the way you speak. They affect everything about your life, but most of all, they affect your relationship with Christ. And so I want to um, look again at Luke 18... 13 through 14, which is the second half of that, the first scripture. And so this is the tax collector's prayer. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I'm going to go back to um, what I found with this Middle Eastern theologian in his book um, and talk about the, the tax collector's prayer. He was so distraught that he beat his chest. And this is something that, that, uh, that was only seen really by, by women in, in this culture, like at funerals and, and other occasions like that. But uh, the only other place we see this in the Bible is after the death of Jesus, the crowd, they beat their chest. Um, the, you know, his loved ones beat their chest. And so this just shows such a, a, a parallel to, um, to just the death of Jesus. And I, and I think that Jesus is kind of hinting to the future, to what it is that he does for us. Because another thing that, that comes from this is um, in the verse where it says, uh, have mercy on me, the, the true translation is God, make, it, make an atonement for me. And so... I did a little research just, so, just to better understand this, to see you know, what atonement means. You know, I knew the, the gist of it, but I wanted to get the, you know, the real, like what, what he's talking about, what he means by atonement here. And atonement is a payment of some kind, whether you know, by uh, you know, money or just currency of some kind or a physical payment. It's a payment of some, time, of some kind. And so he's asking, God, make an atonement for me. And, and so... Uh, when I read this and, and, uh, and, I, and I prayed about it and I thought more on it, I realized that um, the tax collector, in the most humble way possible, he has this humble realization and request of God to pay God back for the debt that he could never pay. Um, and so with this, I think God is hinting, or Jesus is hinting at the future because Jesus is that payment. Jesus is that atonement from God to God for the debt that we can never pay, for the debt of our sin. And so I think Jesus is using this to hint into the future um, of what is to come of his death and resurrection. And I want to um, 
talk a little bit more about this with a quote from the, uh, I forgot the, I was going to write down the author's name, but I forgot to, of that book. But it says, the tax collector who feels that the lamb, lowercase lamb, cannot possibly atone for his sin is the one whom Jesus pronounces justified or accepted in God's presence. And so uh, I read this verse because that is, that's the way we need to approach God with this um, sin in our life that we want to believe isn't there or isn't that bad. We need to approach God like the tax collector, humbled at the fact that we can never pay for this debt and that we have to ask God, we have to humble ourselves and ask God to pay Himself for our debt. And I want to end with um, one more passage of Scripture, a prayer that you can find in Psalms 139. And uh, somehow I got sabotaged again. Somebody changed it. Psalms 139, 23 through 24. Get there. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so I, I end tonight. I want this to be your prayer. I want you to approach God as the tax collector did, humbled at the fact that you could never repay God for the sin that is in your life. But because of God's payment, because of Jesus, the uppercase lamb, God has paid Himself back and we can live free of our sin. And that's, that's, uh, that's all I have. So I'm going to end this in prayer and we're going to worship God for what He's done and what He's going to do in our lives. Dear Lord, thank You for loving us first off. Thank You, God, for giving me this opportunity. Lord, I pray that um, I did You justice, Lord. God, thank you so much that, that we can never pay for our sin, but that you loved us enough to send your only son, the uppercase lamb, God, the atonement to pay for the sin that plagues our lives. God, and I, I thank you that we are free from our sin. God, and I pray that we will embrace this freedom. God, embrace your spirit and just live for you. God, stop lying to ourselves. Stop lying to you and realize that if we are a child of God, God, if we have accepted you into our heart, we are free from the sin and there's no reason for us to live in the chains of it anymore. So God, I pray that you will search our hearts and find our anxious thoughts, find anything that brings offense to you, God, and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Thank you. stand to worship Lord I come I confess bowing here I find my rest without you Thank you.
righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Let's sing that one more time and y'all really think about how it relates to what Matt just told us. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you, my one defense.